Um, first, I wanted to acknowledge our funding agencies, so the National Science Foundation, Schmidt Future, no, Schmidt Science, um, Sciences, and then the Euro European Research Council. And today, I wanted to talk about some of the excitement I've been having over the last couple of years, which are to use machine learning not just for emulation to represent complex multiscale processes, but also to make new discoveries on the way, because as physicists, we want to learn new things. I, just to give you a little bit of introduction about myself and kind of my group, we try to tackle two things, uh, two components of the Earth system, so one being the land and the other one being the atmosphere. could never decide, so a little bit bipolar, you could say, to some extent. Uh, but the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in those two is because they are very complex in nature and very multiscale in nature, right? right? And, and, and there are lots of very interesting problems uh, leading to that. So why is the land interesting? First off, that's where we live, right? Uh, there are multiple complexities, you know, whether that's on the natural system, but also in the urban system as well. It's also a major carbon dioxide sink, right? So uh, roughly these days, it's about one third, so 29 to 31% of anthropogenic emissions that are being taken back by the, uh, by the, by the land surface. So it's a major sink, which is really, really crucial to actually mitigate some of climate change, right? So something we really need to actually keep track of, track of and understand whether that will still be continuing moving into the future. And I'd like to point out, and we'll get back to this in a minute, and, oh, sorry, the pointer is not work, work, working on the screen, but uh, the land sink is actually what you can see here, as opposed to, say, the ocean here. So the main point here is that the ocean sink is very smooth, right? It tends to have very kind of slow variability on very long time scales. The land tend to be very highly variable, right? Especially on annual time scales. So a lot of that is related to El Nino. You might have heard about El Nino. And that leads to major droughts and increase in temperature across the Earth. Uh, for instance, when we have uh, these days uh, uh, an El Nino event, we're also looking at what's the compound event with climate change. So that's something we'll try to think, uh, to keep in mind for, for later in the talk. So there's substantial variability, and we really need to keep track of that and understand why we have such a variability. And the land is fundamentally a multiscale process. So from, it's actually very interesting. You can look at stomata from a very physically based mechanism, you know, like small pores that are actually regulating the amount of carbon that's being picked up by the, by the land surface. Very, very crucial for the carbon uh, uh, cycle. All the way to multiscale turbulence in the canopy at the, at the ecosystem scale. All the way to the watershed or even the ecosystem or the, the, the regional scale. And in fact, in my group, we are trying to tackle most of those scales using a, a lot of computational tools from like lattice Boltzmann methods or larger dissimulations and uh, numerical and observational data as well. So we'll get into observations and how that can be used, especially at the global scale, to constrain those processes. The atmosphere is also very important. So uh, very important to, of course, controlling the, the water cycle and hydrological flow. So that's basically the, the main regulator of precipitation across the globe. And you can see that's actually a great uh, a picture or video actually taken from GPM, so a suite of satellites, looking at the multi-scale variability that we have. And you can really see all sorts of systems, you know, from mesoscale convective systems, say, in the Amazon, which, are, which have a very strong diurnal cycle, all the way to more like synoptic-driven type event when we start looking at mean latitude. So there's a very strong multi-scale, but also very regional type perspective in there. And clouds, uh, in particular, are actually really, really crucial for climate feedback and to actually regulate climate sensitivity. Uh, so that's why they are very important. They tend to be also extremely multi-scale from like uh, sub-millimeter scale. So when we start thinking about cloud droplets or ice crystal formation, all the way to multiple kilometers and how they actually start to organize. And we'll try to show today that this, this is actually very important. It's one of the major uncertainties that we have when we try to think about climate feedback and climate sensitivity and the response of the Earth to the, to the carbon dioxide and to the greenhouse gas forcing. So that's really something we really need to nail down when we want to look into the future. And of course, and it goes without saying that the atmosphere tends to be multi-scale in nature, right? It's a highly turbulent medium with multiple types of turbulence on the way, also multiple uh, waves, uh, gravity waves in particular, which are highly organizing uh, the turbulence and the, 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 the spectrum that we are actually seeing in the atmosphere, right? So there's a very strong multi-scale nature in the atmosphere as well. Okay, so today I wanted to talk mostly about um, one thing, which is how can we actually go around uh, climate processes and especially physical and, and, and processes that are regulating climate on different timescales? And then I'll try to uh, 
basically highlight the fact that we can go beyond just emulation using observations and using high resolution simulation, but we can also on the way make new discoveries and try to learn new physics that we didn't know before. So kind of the, especially with our center, the main gap we're trying to, to solve is trying to focus mostly on climate, climate adaptation. Uh, and it goes without saying these days that climate adaptation is very much required, right? So we, we are witnessing more and more extremes, droughts, flooding events, heat waves, or like the wildfire uh, season and the smoke associated with that that we witnessed here in New York uh, last June. And we're witnessing basically more and more of those events. They tend to be more frequent, but also more intense. And we really need to actually nail down the, their changes so that we can be more prepared as a society. And to do, so what, to do so, what we do is we actually run models, right? So some physically based simulation to actually predict the future. We call that a projection when we look at a 10 year time scale or more. And we try to use that as a way to inform basically policymakers, but also like adaptation policies in particular. And to actually get to climate adaptation, there's also a second part that's typically forgotten is also providing data at scale. And that's something we are trying to do with modern cloud data infrastructure. That's something we are trying to do in our center so that people can get access to climate data at scale. And we're also targeting the global south that people can really try to understand how climate change is going to affect their community. And we are trying to provide that through a modernized cloud platform. And you can think of that, it's basically like, uh, oh, sorry. <clears throat> you could think of that it's like Google Map, but for, 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 for climate forecast and climate projections. So, but today I won't talk really too much about that. I'll be mostly focusing on physics. If you're interested, talk to me after the talk. So the main issue that we have these days is that if we take some of basic metrics of climate change, so taking, for instance, global uh, surface air temperature, which is depicted here, you can see that there's actually sub substantial spread across different models. So again, we use those physical models to actually project the future here going, say, to 2060. And the spread that you see here is actually the envelope based on different models coming from different modeling centers coming from different regions of the globe. And the main take home here is that the model spread, so the intermodal variability between different modeling centers is almost as large as the, the, the range we are trying to predict and the trend we are trying to predict, right? So the uncertainty is tremendous. And that's for a very, very simple metric, which is associated basically with climate change which is used very much by policymakers, such as for the Paris Agreement, when we talk about 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, that's really what we are talking about. And we are talking about the change compared to pre-industrial levels. But again, the uncertainties are just way too large to be very informative. And so we have to deal with this huge amount of uncertainty. It's not just a global issue if you start zooming in. So that's at the regional scale. Uh, here over the US, nothing special about it, but just to give a sense. You can look at, for instance, precipitation distribution. So really just the, 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 the distribution of precipitation here in the summer. And the main take home here is that if you look at the observations coming from uh, uh, multiple platforms here, from rain gauges in particular, in black, and you compare that to a standard model, which is the, the green line here, the co cost resolution model, you can see that we are very much underestimating the extremes of rainfall, which are, again, what's really driving the impact, right? And, and most of the extremes that we are interested in, right? So you could really take from that that models are really not up to the task. We are really lagging behind in terms of what is needed for people to actually uh, adapt. And I'd like to point out, and we'll get back to this in a minute, is that when you actually push the resolution, so those models tend to be very coarse in scale, roughly 100 kilometers or so, at higher resolution, which is on the order of a few kilometers, we tend to do a much, much better job, right? We tend to represent thunderstorms much better, and we can start to represent some of those extremes better. So there's some hope there, like pushing for resolution in particular. We can look at the carbon cycle here, which is uh, at the bottom. So again, thinking about the land carbon cycle and the ocean carbon cycle, and thinking again about projections into the future. And the main take home here is that we have huge uncertainties again, so the same type of plot, looking at the intermodal variability across different models from coming from different modeling centers. And the main take home here in terms of land is that we don't even know whether we'll have a sink or if we'll have a major source into the future, right? So we are basically in the dark in terms of understanding the future carbon cycle. So that's a major issue if you th start thinking about climate mitigation strategies because that uh, uh, we'd like to know whether we'll keep roughly one third of the emissions and we'll keep that moving forward into the future. So we really need to nail that down. That's actually quite critical. 
So why is that? So why do we have so many uncertainties? You can actually pinpoint a lot of those uncertainties to the fact that models tend to be very coarse in scale. So that's uh, a typical climate model grid size, which is on the order of 100 kilometers or so. And what we need to do is we need to basically make up for things we cannot represent at that, at that scale, right? So one example of which is basically clouds, right? They tend to be much, much smaller than a grid size. Or you could think about ocean eddies. Uh, Lorzana was here a few uh, weeks ago, so that's typically what she's working on, trying to represent the multi-scale nature of ocean eddies uh, uh, at the subgrid scale. But you also have processes that are not just dependent on resolution, but that are poorly known, such as photosynthesis, right? We understand photosynthesis relatively well at the leaf level. Forget about one single tree, uh, a lot of structure, for, for instance, in nutrients, and forget even about an ecosystem. That becomes very, very complicated. Right? And all of those uh, uh, um, approximations basically in tandem lead to a lot of the uncertainties I showed you before. Clouds are really crucial for temperature and climate sensitivity. They are one of the main uh, uh, reasons why we have such a spread in, uh, in, uh, between different models. Ocean eddies are really critical for ocean heat content. In fact, there's tremendous amount of spread again in terms of how much we expect the, 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 the storage to be in the ocean. And same goes for photosynthesis. We, have a paper, we had a paper a few years ago uh, in Nature showing that actually there's tr tremendous, most of the variability we are seeing in the carbon cycle can be related to photosynthesis and how that's actually responding to water stress. So what it means is we really need to nail down and pin pinpoint those processes and trying to do a better job at representing them at that coarser scale or maybe pushing potentially for resolution. But really at the end of the day, the, the uncertainties are coming from the fact that we have unresolved or unknown, sometimes it's not just resolution, but the fact we just don't know the processes in the first place. And that really dominates most of the errors I showed you before. So what are the strategies we have you know, to actually move forward and to actually do a better job at representing those processes? You could say we could use some sort of multi-scale type of approach, right? So on the right-hand side is kind of the objective that we have. We have a very coarse climate model, which is roughly on the order of a resolution of hundreds of kilometers running on the, over the entire globe for centennial time scales, right? Very, very long time scales, right? We can run all sorts of simulation looking at greenhouse gas forcing and the response. And what we could do is we could say, let's push, for the, resu push the resolution, right? So we can start resolving more and more of the processes that we couldn't resolve at the very coarse scale resolution. So one strategy is to run what we call a cloud resolving model, which is a simulation on the order of a few kilometers or so, which is actually resolving big clouds, right, thunderstorms in particular. And they tend to do a much better job. We'll see that in terms of representing precipitation, and that's the example I showed you before. And one advantage that we have is that because we are pushing with the resolution, there are fewer and fewer things that we actually need to make up for, right? So because we're actually resolving more and more of the processes, right? You could actually get down the line here, and you could actually say, let me go for even higher resolution, which is what we call a large eddy simulation, so a turbulent resolving simulation where we can resol resolve big eddies in particular. But of course, we are limited by compute, right? So we can only run those simulations over a relatively short domain, small domain, or short time horizon, right? So there are limits to that. And you could push all the way to the bottom where there's basically no assumption made here, which is di direct numerical simulations. Uh, if you've done some turbulent simulations, that's basically you're resolving the entire spectrum. But you can only do that over a small box, right? Because uh, you're limited in terms of the scale. So one solution basic, basically to solve this issue would be just to push for more compute, right? So you could actually leverage, for instance, farms of GPUs or high, highly parallelized compute. But there are still issues even with the best computers that we have right now. We can actually barely go to cloud resolving models for like a couple of decades, right? Or even a decade is very complicated. So, one way around that would be to say, can we actually go the other way around, right? Where we could say, can we learn from simulations that we can run at higher resolution, right? And then use that as a way to inform coarser and coarser resolution, right? So basically, we want to emulate that using machine learning and using some sort of leap in terms of multi-scale type approach where we can use the finer scale to actually inform the slightly bigger scale and then moving up the ladder of scale, right? So using this really multi-scale type of approach so we can inform those climate model simulations. So that's what I'm going to show you today. And I'd like to emphasize that there are many processes we are not resolving even with that. So that applies really for fluids, right? So in the atmosphere in particular or when we 
don't really have phase change, and when we look at the ocean in particular, but there are many, issue, many processes where we, don't, we cannot directly use that uh, type of strategy, right? For one example is what we call microphysics, uh, so cloud droplet formation on ice crystals. Uh, they are actually happening at the, sub, uh, at the micrometer scale to a sub-millimeter scale, so there's no way we can actually resolve that. We don't even understand really how they, they are functioning and how they are forming. Or even looking again at the landscape, right, where it's highly complex and it's not just pushing the resolution, right? There's, there are uh, emergent properties at the, at the landscape scale, right? So there I would say our best bet would be to actually use observations, right? Observations can be a way to actually move forward and actually trying to, to bridge the gap between complexity and trying to have a sense of the emergent behavior at the landscape scale, right? That might be the right way to do it. So one way we, we have, so one uh, approach we have these days to actually uh, uh, address those issues and especially the, the representation of those small scale processes is that we are very lucky to have a suite of satellites coming from, we have many, many uh, uh, satellites uh, 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 orbiting around the Earth observing many aspects of the Earth, right? So we can actually leverage that to understand many new processes, right? We have, uh, and that's an example here of a global cloud reserving model of roughly a kilometer scale, but we have a lot of high resolution simulations. I mentioned some of them before, direct numerical simulations, large dissimulation or cloud resolving models. And what we can do is we can really harvest those simulations to actually inform what should be done at the cost of scale resolution. And of course, what you need is you only need to have basically algorithms that can actually leverage those data at scale. And basically, it goes without saying, so a few years ago, it was difficult to convince people, but now it goes without saying that AI has been showing very strong promises across many, many areas of science, but also in, uh, in our everyday life, right? So we have very efficient algorithms to leverage those data. And the question is, can we also learn on the way, not just emulating, but also learning new things? So I'll try to show you a couple of examples in terms of how we can use AI to improve the representation of those processes, starting with the atmosphere, and then we'll move on to also the land, just with one particular example. So our typical strategy here will be to take uh, some high resolution, so trustworthy, you could say, simulation, right? And what we'll do is we'll try to actually cause grains at that simulation so that it looks like the cost resolution simulation we have, which is basically akin to the, to the climate model scale. And what we'll do is basically we'll do what we call a, a supervised learning type uh, framework where we will have some cost scale variable and we'll try to predict at the same scale, which is very coarse, and we'll use that high resolution cost grain to actually learn uh, uh, processes. So that's gonna be the, the, the first strategy we'll have here on the left-hand side. So just basically replicating or emulating what is being told uh, to us by the high resolution simulation. And you can apply that to many different things. Uh, so just to give you a sense of things we've been working in our center and also as part of the group, you can use that to look at land atmosphere exchange, so evaporation, uh, and you can actually show that you can do a much better job at representing photosynthesis or evaporation using such, a, such techniques, and in particular by bridging physics and machine learning together, you can represent extremes really well, heat waves and droughts uh, uh, in particular. You can represent things that can be very complicated to represent with physical models, such as wildfires. Uh, they can be very stochastic, very random in nature, very difficult to represent, so you can actually do a, a good job uh, using machine learning, and we've shown that using satellite observation for the triggering, but also for the spreading of, uh, of, of wildfires. You can do that for another component of the, of the Earth system, which is snow water, and especially snow mass, which is with snow water mass, which tends to be very difficult to predict, especially in the spring, very critical for water resources in, uh, 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 in the spring, because that's the timing of the, of, the, of the snow melt is quite critical for that. You can look at turbulence, going beyond just trying to predict turbulence, but trying to understand turbulence, what are the main modes of variability of turbulence, looking at convection as opposed to shear, how that's actually organizing, organizing the flow and the transport of different tracers in the atmosphere. You can look at radiation. Uh, so that's been actually the first, that was the first thing that was used for emulation using uh, machine learning back uh, in Europe at the European Center for Medium Weather Forecast, where they try to actually mimic radiation because it's a very uh, expensive part of the climate model. And they could show you could do a, a good job here. And what we are trying to do is trying to represent the effect of small scale variability and clouds in particular. But for today, I'll try to focus on two things which are going to be clouds, uh, and I mentioned that before. 
and I'll talk about phenology. So basically, the timing, the seasonal timing of, uh, of the, the land surface and vegetation and what is actually, uh, what are the main drivers of that. And I'd like to emphasize that many of those processes are actually not resolved when we actually go even to higher resolution. So it's more than just resolution, right? It's also like understanding how those processes are actually functioning. So the first thing we are going to do is looking at, can we actually replicate precipitation? So I showed you before that precipitation tend to be very poorly represented in Earth system models and climate models in particular. So can we do a better job at representing those processes? And what we'll do is we'll use some, what we call cl global cloud resolving simulation. So this high resolution simulation, roughly at 2.5 kilometer, that's the one we have here. We're gonna coarse grain that, so we have the 2.5 kilometer resolution, coarse grain to 100 kilometer resolution, which is equivalent to the climate model simulation scale. And now we are gonna be trying to learn the salient features that we have at that coarse scale resolution, which is going to be based on the fine scale re resolution, right? So we are trying to make up for the fact that we don't have that resolution, and we'll try to see is that sufficient. And our strategy will be quite simple. We'll have basically the core scale state, right? So temperature, moisture, and wind in the entire atmospheric profile. <clears throat> and we'll try to predict basically the tendency, so the rate of change of temperature and moisture. So basically the heating and the moistening of the, of the atmospheric column as a function of the different levels. And we are doing that again at the core scale resolution of about 100 kilometers. And if you wanted the, the details here, I mean, they are, they are here, no need to really get into that. But the main take home here is that we are again using a supervised type of approach where we are actually trying to replicate the high resolution simulation. And then what we do is we actually plug that, so we replace the representation of clouds and especially what we call deep convection, so deep clouds that are precipitating. We are plugging that into the host climate model, and we are replacing the way we have represented that before with the so-called physically-based parameterization. We're replacing that by a, basically a big neural network. And then we actually let that evolve, right? So it's living its own life, and we are actually checking whether the, the climate that will be represented by this hybrid model, which is physically-based but also has a, a, a neural network as part of that, is that actually realistic in terms of mean climate? So on the left-hand side here, what you have is the climate from the you know, from, the, from the high resolution simulation as a function of latitude, so that's the mean climate, as a function of pressure, so you could think of that, that's the same as height. And here is actually the, the model that has the embedded neural network that's basically removing a lot of the high resolution complexity just at the core scale and replacing the, the, the complexity of the, 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 the convection and deep, deep clouds by the neural network. And the main take home here is that this is just a plot of the bias here. You can see that there's very minimal bias compared to the original climate. So what it means is it's very promising. It means that we can actually replace complex physics and especially this multi-scale nature of precipitation and convection, so deep clouds. We can represent that by just a neural network as a function of just the core scale state. So we can basically make up for the implicit uh, small scale variability that was actually quite critical. And I'd like to contrast that with what we have on the right-hand side, which is a standard model, which is basically the kind of the empirical way we use to represent parameterization. And you can see that you have major biases in terms of the mean climate. We have what we call this double intertropical convergence so zone. So that's a major, major bias for the climate, especially in the tropics. So that's a major issue we know in climate models. So we were actually very happy when we saw that. So again, the model is what we call online. So it's actually working and living its own life within the host model. So that's quite, that was quite exciting. We can look at, uh, I should mention that this was for an aquaplanet. So we actually didn't have any land, just to, to a more like academic type problem in that case. And we pushed that to actually include some land representation here. So in that case, you have realistic geography. And basically, you have the land and the continents and also topography, as you would have uh, over a real Earth. And again, you can see that at the top, you have the high resolution simulation here. At the bottom, you have the neural network emulation. Here, we're looking at snapshot to snapshot, so it's not really embedded within the host model. We're just trying to replicate every single time step. But the main take home here is that uh, there's actually very good reprodu reproducibility of the neural network of the fine scale structure, right? So that's, again, quite encouraging. It means that we can actually do a great job, especially for precipitation. You can see that we are capturing a lot of the extremes, something that was missing before when we had the, just the standard uh, uh, cost resolution model, right? So it means that we can actually embed those uh, uh, neural networks and actually create this kind of hybrid type approach where 
those models have some mixture between some parts of neural networks and some physical consistency as well, and they tend to do a better job at actually predicting the future. And we can look at some things such as precipitation distribution, which is here on the left-hand side, and you can see that, again, when we plug this neural network, we are doing a much better job compared to the high-resolution simulation, so precipitation distribution is really improving even within the host model, right? So now we are capturing the extremes, and those extremes were not captured by the original cost resolution model that we had here on the left-hand side. Okay, so that's very encouraging. It means, again, that now we can actually have pretty decent hydrological cycle, and we can start thinking about extremes uh, and flooding, for instance, if you're interested in flooding and inundation. We can also look at some uh, specificities, such as the diurnal cycle. Uh, we know, and we've known for many, many years, that climate models don't have the right timing of precipitation. You could say, um, okay, maybe it doesn't matter when you think about climate time scale, but that's actually quite crucial because it also means that the processes are actually quite incorrect, right? We don't have the right type of precipitation. We don't have, for instance, mesoscale convective systems. And again, you can show that we have this typical issue in the standard uh, uh, climate model, which is at the bottom here, which tends to actually precipitate early afternoon, which is this very well-known bias that we have. And again, if you look at the US, we can see now we have two peaks similar to the high resolution model when we embed this neural network into a host climate model. So we can solve a lot of the issues related to, to the representation of precipitation when we actually do that process. We can also look not just at uh, integrated values, but we can look at things that are really fundamentally multi-scale. We can look at spectra. And again, we can see a huge advantage when we start to embed this kind of neural network into the, the, the host climate model. We can actually get a very good spectral representation, especially of the what we call the madden julian oscillation and of Kelvin waves, so waves that are propagating on planetary scales. So, Really, those neural networks are doing more than just a basic mean emulation. It's actually trying to represent the extremes and also trying to represent this multi-scale interac interaction with the, the host model at a cost of resolution. So that result, we thought, was actually very important. And that's, again, to be contrasted with the standard cost resolution model, which is doing a very poor job in terms of representing those modes of variability, which are really crucial for climate. So that's, that was good news. We thought, OK, we have something. Uh, but there was one challenge, which was that, of course, it works well when we are trying to emulate and we have past climates in particular. Uh, but the main issue we have is that trying to extrapolate beyond things we've seen in the past, right? So climate change is basically an out of distribution prediction, right? We, we have climate from the past. We don't really know the future climate. And the question is, how can we actually do a, a good job in terms of projecting the, the, the future? And one approach to that is actually to use what we call a multi-fidelity type approach, where what you can do is you could say, if I were to just use a neural network or a machine learning approach just trained on the past, it will really have an issue extrapolating beyond what it's been trained on, right, by definition, right? It hasn't seen the future. And what you could do is you could say, maybe I can actually in, in involve some sort of physical intuition, right, some physical uh, inductive bias. And the idea is to use this kind of multi-fidelity approach where you have what we call a physically-based approach, which is here on the left-hand side, and you're going to be correcting its structure using past information, right? And you're basically going to have the same as what we had before. We are going to have this high-fidelity correction using basically fine, detailed, and high-resolution simulations to basically correct the physics, right? So we can have the extrapolating capacity of the physics, and at the same time, we can correct that to make sure that it's doing a good job, right? So we're getting kind of the best of both worlds, right? physical extrapolation and the high quality data-driven approach that we, we, we had before. And we can show that when we do that, it actually works well. So that's an example where we try to actually look at a, 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 a climate uh, warming um, uh, extrapolation scenario of plus four uh, Kelvin. At the top here, you have basically the strategy I showed you before. You're trying to basically mimic the past, right? You have a neural network that's basically going to be embedded into your neural network, into your, your host model. And you're trying to then use that to actually predict the future. And basically, it fails miserably, right? So the R-square here is actually very low. It has very low capacity to actually predict into the future. And especially in regions of the globe that tend to be much warmer than before, right? Especially in the tropics, right? Because those are the places that are going to be the warmest. 
the traditional model that I showed you before wasn't working so well. He's actually doing a slightly better job. So that's the one we have here in the middle. He's doing a slightly better job than the so-called uh, high resolution uh, 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 emulation that we had before. Now, if you combine them together, that's the multi-fidelity here at the bottom, now you can do a good job into the future, right? So again, you're bringing the, the extrapolation capacity of the physical model or your physical intuition, so your phenomenological model, and then you're correcting that with some sort of machine learning. Uh, you could say it's a fancy bias correction, if you will, right? You're correcting the structure, but you're correcting the structure just based on the past and using, again, the, the extrapolation capacity of the model. There are some other strategies, so no, no, no time to get into that here, but you actually can embed some physical invariances as well uh, uh, using groups, or you could actually also merge some sort of causality and machine learning, and that actually helps as well in terms of projecting the future. If you're interested, happy to talk to you about that later. So just a quick summary of uh, kind of a journey uh, through the use of machine learning in climate science. Um, I, I would say it's been kind of a roller coaster for me. So at first, we were very, very excited by the fact that we could actually correctly emulate convection, especially in the past. But then we realized that there were all sorts of issues, especially related to extrapolating to the future, which is basically what we want to do, right? We want to be able to actually predict, the, the, predict climate change. Also, some technical issues related to stability because those neural networks can go crazy sometimes, and there may be some instability, and so we, we work quite a bit on that. But kind of my recent work, and I showed you some of that, is actually trying to focus more on can we actually embed some sort of physical invariances or physical conservations in there, and including some causality so can, we can actually generalize and we be way more stable into a scenario we haven't seen, so especially uh, related to climate change. But I would say more fundamentally, and that's really kind of the focus for the rest of the talk, is can we actually use machine learning not just for emulation, but to actually make new discoveries, right? So I'll try to show you a few examples as to how we can actually do that. And I would say, as physicists, I mean, personally, that's my primary interest. So how can we use AI to go beyond emulation, but to go really to new discoveries? And we'll get back to this here, but we'll try to use different strategies here, and we'll try to use what we call explainable AI, so trying to actually look at some of the data and trying to explain that better. We use some sort of latent space, so some sort of embedding where we'll try to com compress basically the information into something that's actually understandable so we can understand some of the basic physics in there. And then we'll try to use also maybe some equation discovery, right? So those are some of the, the key or three, three ingredients we can use to actually build some interpretability and understanding in terms of the physics we've learned. So the first example we look at will be to look at, uh, again, those clouds, right, and looking at what we call deep convection. And what happens is that in reality and in simulations as well, clouds and deep convection can actually organize, right? So sometimes it can be very patchy, like what you have at the top, like popcorn-like convection, right? Very random. And it can really organize into like a big cluster, right? And you could say maybe it doesn't matter that much, but it does in the sense that that has a huge impact in terms of precipitation because there's some sort of sheltering uh, that, uh, that is happening here. So you get a lot more precipitation here, right? They, those guys are actually sheltering each other, so there's a lot more rainfall at the bottom. It also has a huge impact in terms of the atmospheric profile because the bottom is actually much, much drier. The atmospheric profile is much drier than what you have at the top. And what this leads to is it has a huge impact on what we call climate sensitivity, so basically on the radiation back to space. So we believe that this aggregation is actually quite critical for climate and for the hydrological cycle. So that's something we want to actually nail down. And so you could say, so uh, when we think of that, it's actually very similar to the climate model, like big uh, pixel that I showed you before. So can we get a sense as to how is that aggregation actually impacting the result, right? Is that important when we start thinking about the core scale? So one way to think about that is that we can say we can write precipitation as a function of the core scale, right? That's what we had before with our big neural network. And we are just going to be adding one thing, which is the so-called microstate, right? We want to say, do we need to carry some of the microstate? Do we need to have information about the microstate to actually characterize the core source scale, right? So that's going to be important. So we're going to be calling that subgrid scale stuff, right? That's going to be referring to the aggregation. And then maybe potentially, that's a second question we'll try to answer on the way, is that can that explain what people call the precipitation stochasticity, right? There's a lot of variability in precipitation. 
people have spent a lot of efforts in terms of trying to actually add some stochasticity to the representation of precipitation in weather models and climate models. And they believe it's actually crucial because it increases the spread and the, the ensemble of variability. And we, they believe it's actually quite critical for climate variability and weather variability. Right? So we'll try to see if those two are linked. And of, of course, you, you can guess that they are linked. So what we'll do is we'll get back to this high resolution simulation. Right? So we'll do the same trick we, we did before. Take the high resolution field, which is roughly on the order of 2.5 kilometer, coarse grain that 200 kilometer, and then we are going to be analyzing those data. So basically, that's the setup. So same as what we've done before. <clears throat> you take those snapshots at high resolution, coarse grain them, so you go, go from like basically an image to just a single variable, plug that into a neural network, and then you want to predict your precipitation. Right? So that's kind of the baseline. And we are going to say, do we need to add some sort of microstate here, right? Which is going to be characterizing what we have at the at, uh, uh, at, at a scale that cannot be characterized by just this core scale. And that's going to be what we call the organization your network, which is going to be the same here, except that we are going to be adding this kind of latent space here. So very very few dimensions. It's actually only two dimensional here. And that's a space that is actually trying to do two things, right? It's trying to actually encode the information we have in the high resolution field, right, into just those two dimensions here, trying to replicate that. So we, have, we also have like a rotational and, and translation invariance. Doesn't really matter that much, but we're trying to basically reproduce that field and at the same time plugging that so that we can actually predict precipitation at the same time. Okay, so Basically, what we are trying to do, we are trying to encode or compress the information we have in the high resolution field and saying, does that matter for precipitation? Right? That's kind of the, the game. And if you wanted to know the details, we train that end to end. So we are trying to train those two things together. We are trying to reproduce the high resolution field, and we are trying to reproduce precipitation at the same time. Right? So it's uh, actually done in parallel. So when we look at the baseline scenario that we had, again, just plug the coarse resolution field, try to predict precipitation. We, in fact, when we look at the details, for the extremes, we are not doing such a great job. Right? We have the same issue we had before, which is what, that we tend to actually be too coarse in terms of the resolution that we have. Okay? And we could also look at the temporal resolution, and we could look at the statistics of that. And in fact, we could show that we have no scale whatsoever when we look at the temporal dynamics of that thing. So the, 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 the R square is basically zero. Now, if we start adding the organization in there, and so we start adding this like, subgrid organization uh, 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 latent space to actually also help predicting precipitation, now you can see that we are actually spot on in terms of the extremes. right? So, what this means is that the microstate is actually critical to get the ex to the extremes, right? In other words, the fact that what I showed you before, the fact that things tend to organize or tend to be clustered is critical to get to those extremes, right? And the advantage is because it's 2D, you can actually visualize that. And in fact, you can visualize that indeed, it's what I should, told you before, it's actually the clustering or the aggregation, and it's also the elongation of that, that clustering, right? So those are the two dimensions, right? How clustered it is, how aggregated it is, and how elongated it is, right? Is it more of a score line or a, a, a regular mesos mesoscale convective system? And the other advantage that we have is that now if we start looking at the temporal dynamics of that, by including this, uh, uh, this microstate in there, now we have very, very good scale. So what this means is that basically precipitation is not stochastic, but it's actually something that is highly deterministic and predictable, except the only thing is that we need to have access to this microstate. Okay? And if you're interested, you can actually characterize and you can have an equation for that microstate that you can carry forward with you. So that's fine. You can actually characterize that. So basically what did we learn is that the microstate, or what we call the organization, organization regulates precipitation extremes, right? And it's actually critical to get to those extremes, so that's something we need to actually include. And it also basically shows that most of the precipitation stochasticity is actually not stochastic, right? It's just the fact that you had, you had a higher dimensional system and you truncated that system, and it appears to you to be stochastic, but it's not, right? It's a deterministic system that was just truncated in terms of, of dimensions, right? But that basically shows that. I will just basically wrap up talking about one another um, artillery that we have in our, uh, um, to actually understand uh, uh, 
understand processes better, which is what we call symbolic regression, right? So one thing you can do is that sometimes you'd like to have a physical equation, right? Because you'd like to actually investigate that and you'll try to actually, you want to have an equation because either you want to plug that in a model or you want to just visualize and understand that, right? I mean, there's nothing better than an equation. And so that's an exa example here where we take again this high resolution simulation. This is the cloud cover field, so just one snapshot, uh, nothing special here. And we are gonna be trying to actually replicate that and what we are doing is actually we are trying to replicate that using an equation, right? And so what we use is we use this symbolic regression uh, toolbox. Basically, we're trying to regress onto a library of functions. And then we come up with that, uh, uh, basically, uh, symbolic regression or this equation discovery. So that's the equation that we have as a function of relative humidity and the gradient that we have in the vertical. And then you have a few coefficients that need to be tuned and that are tuned on that particular high resolution simulation. And then what we can do is we can use what we call transfer learning in the sense that we can take those coefficients and we can just fine tune them. We know the equation, but we could just fine tune them to the observations, right? The observations are here. And you can see that the cloud cover is a, a lot less, uh, 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 is a lot less, um, uh, is not as high as what we have basically in the high resolution simulation. So there's two steps. First, we discover the equation on, on the high resolution simulation and then we fine tune that using this so-called transfer learning by fine-tuning the coefficient to actually replicate that. And when we get that, we can actually get to something that's very, very tightly, and that's in the fully coupled model, that's something that's very tightly related to the observations and much better than the original scheme or much better than the high-resolution simulation. Okay, so using that, we can do even better than the high-resolution simulation. We can actually merge that with the observation in a very consistent way. Right? So it's actually better than even the high resolution simulation, even though it's run, again, at the cost scale resolu resolution. My colleague, Laura Zana, has been applying that. So she was there a few weeks ago, looking at the same, looking, uh, same type of strategy, using equation discovery to look at uh, symbolic regression for ocean momentum. And they could actually basically discover uh, the uh, subgrid momentum parameterization and, the, the, uh, and its tensor. And which is actually very related to something she had discovered earlier, so she could actually find back something that she, uh, that, that she, uh, she, she was quite aware of. And what they did then was trying to actually plug that into this coarse resolution ocean model. So that's the coarse resolution model here without any type of uh, uh, um, uh, subgrid sub parameterization. That's the, the equation discovery right there, and that's the high resolution field, and you can see that the two are much more alike. So it means that, again, there's potential for those equation discoveries to actually uh, be, be plugged in there. Okay. I'll wrap up um, very quickly. So some other work we are trying to do is to look at land uh, phenology in particular. So that's something very important to actually monitor climate change. We know that there has been substantial change, for instance, in leaf out and the end of season of the leaves. And we'd like to understand what are the main drivers. So it goes beyond just a botani botanical type interest, but trying to really understand what are the drivers of climate change on the land and on the terrestrial ecosystems. And that's quite critical, not just for the long term, but also for the interannual variability that I showed you before. So no need to really get into that today, but basically we can use satellites to actually get into that and really pinpoint what are the main drivers and using explainable AI uh, to actually get there. So, just to conclude, so machine learning um, can really improve the representation of subgrid processes in climate models. It's actually working now, so it's not just a proof of concept. We can actually plug those uh, parameterization and those representations in fully uh, physically based model and replacing modules by, 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 by those machine learning algorithms. So it's not a hypothesis anymore whether those work. And they can really represent the multiscale nature, especially of fluids and the atmosphere and the ocean and they can really resolve many of the challenges that we've been having for many decades. And on the way, and I think to me that's almost the most uh, uh, exciting is that we can make new discoveries, right? Because it becomes very challenging these days to actually analyze the terabytes or petabytes of data that those models are generating or that satellites data are generating. So now we can actually start to have techniques to actually analyze those data and making sense of them and getting into some new understanding. So with that, happy to take any questions. Thank you for that uh, really stimulating talk. We have time for some questions.
given that your initial conditions themselves have some uncertainty, and there is kind of a lower bound on the growth of uncertainty just intrinsic to the physics itself that you're stimulating. And I mean, do you have kind of a uh, idea of like how close you are to that bound or? Um, so for the initial conditions, I mean, it depends on what you're looking at. But if you're looking at um, long-term, you know, like decadal time scales, I mean, they tend to actually be very small, the impact, you know. Uh, it leads to a small amount of spread, you know, but it's actually much, much smaller than the spread that we have due to the representation of physical processes. So way, way smaller. They tend to be very important when we start thinking about shorter time scales, so sub-seasonal to seasonal to even like up to a decade, those play, that's where they, they, that starts to be uh, very important. You can use, um, so that's something we are actually doing, we are using a lot of what we call differentiable programming these days, so that you can actually take the gradient and the, 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 the derivative to either the initial conditions or physical parameters or some sort of embed in your network. And so you, basically you can treat them the same way and you can actually retrieve on the way some initial conditions. So that's something we are doing, for instance, for the carbon uh, cycle because we never know what are the existing pools, right? So we don't know how much below ground carbon there is, right? So that's something you can do through some sort of inversion and you can actually include also uncertainty quantification on that. So one of the things that uh, with, um, machine learning does is it learns some response and some function. But is it guaranteed to be causal? I mean, do you have problems with numerical instability with, with some of these learned laws? Yeah. Um, that's a major issue. So we just, uh, uh, a paper, it was released this week, where we tried to embed some sort of causal discovery technique uh, on top of, so we call that a causal neural network. Uh, and that helps tremendously, in the, in, not just in terms of stability, but in terms of sparsity of the representation mm -hmm. as well. And we can show that then when we embed that uh, machine learning algorithm, things become stable. So, and it makes sense, like, I mean, even there, you know, I mean, that's the discussion I had with colleagues. We have tens of millions of data points, and it sounds like a lot, but it's not so much when, when you start thinking about like the degrees of freedom that you have for the input and output, right? So you're very much undersampling your distribution when you start thinking of a, 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 a multivariate distribution. Thanks for a great talk. When I think about uncertainties in climate predictions, one of the big things I think of is how much humans are or aren't polluting the environment. And so I, I guess if I was a policymaker and I saw, hey, there's these big uncertainties depending on how we treat clouds. If we pump the resolution up, uh, we get you know, a, a different prediction for how much uh, hotter it's going to be. Um, I, I guess how much would, you know, if we turned off all of the extra carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere right now, um, is there still like a are we already screwed, kind of, or is there still kind of like yeah, a, so a big spread uh, in what's going to happen? I would yeah. say no kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's basically uh, what this is telling you, right? So those are different scenarios from the okay. basically more optimistic to the more pessimistic. We are definitely not there. We are closer to uh, 245, 2370, maybe 245 people are arguing now. Uh, but, but the main take home here is that there's, there's a time scale also with the carbon cycle and the climate uh, uh, physical uh, response, right? And so when you go to 2060, you don't really see so much of that, right? When you go past that, yes, that's a, a huge, that has a huge influence. But that's why on purpose I stopped at 2060 because that's where what actually matters for, like you could say, planning and infrastructure and, and policy making. But past that, the scenarios for sure, you know, like uh, what humans do uh, uh, is going to be the, the main impact. Cool, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, um, okay, so I, so I understood that you could um, take the um, fine scale model and distill out of it, as it were, by machine learning, a small number of predictive variables which I think of as the sort of the best subgrid parameterization. I didn't understand how in general you would find the evolution equations of those subgrid generals uh, variables. Is that just from your equation discovery or can you simply do a machine learning model on them to learn their time evolution? Um, so it depends. So the um so typically what we call a, 
what we typically do is um, it's just the way uh, uh, climate models, but a lot of physical and computation, computational models like free dynamics or turbulence is the same. What we are typically doing is we have what we call the advection, what we call the dynamical core, like how you move stuff around. And then you have what we call the physics, right? So you could have radiation, convection, microphysics. So we just apply them as a tendency, like a rate of change across two time steps, right? And so that's really what we are trying to do here and trying to, to, to replicate, which is what people do in a standard model, right? So they move the fluid around and then they just apply those different processes. I was thinking more of our slide that had the, I forget, ORD feeding. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so for, for that one, what you can... Um, so my question is how oh, ORG. My question is how do you learn the dynamics of ORG? Yeah. So then we actually investigated the time dependence of that, and we could show that it's a very simple autoregressive model of order one. So it's basically you can have a differential equation for that. So you can carry that forward. So you initialize that, and then you can carry that forward. So it's very straightforward to actually move it around. Yeah. And it's kind of nice because people have been struggling to actually. Um, characterize the autocorrelation in space and time of that organization and, and stochasticity of rainfall, they never know how to apply the noise, what's the structure of the noise, what's the spectrum of the noise in space and time. And just by moving that thing around, it's actually much easier because it's like you could think of that you're moving an, an, an extra variable or two variables. And you can actually really impose that structure in space and time with at basically no cost pretty much. Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, regarding your first discovery, it seemed like you could uh, make the prediction of rain uh, deterministic given the right boundary conditions. I was wondering if that feeds into the quest of uh, seeding rain, like in, in uh, countries. So can we learn anything in terms of what is needed to guarantee that it rains? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah, we have a project actually to look at that, actually from the Ziga Foundation. Yes. To look at cloud seeding, can we actually l use some of those strategies to look at cloud seeding? The, 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 the issue is more about scale, so we also need to look about, a lot about the, the scale at which we can do that. And, and things can be very nonlinear. Uh, if you put too much uh, aerosols, you, know, you can actually shut down the, the response. So it tends to be very, very uh, nonlinear, which is kind of a challenge. Uh, but that's something we are uh, trying to, to look at. Yeah, it's actually very interesting. Um, that was a fantastic talk. I have one question. Oh. Um, one question that I often think about with, um, uh, I guess, the comparison of a machine learning output um, to a, a ground truth is there are often models, um, and I noticed a lot of uh, ERA-5 and, and things like that here. So do you have a framework for comparing with um, an in situ observation or remote sensing observation, something a little bit more direct with all of the qualifications of like the spatial, you know, and temporal. Yeah, so um, we are actually developing those. So we are trying to develop some what we call typically data assimilation, but we are trying to develop new tools that can, can actually embed um, machine learning in them. Uh, so without getting into the weeds, but it's all based on what we call differential programming. Like again, the, the fact that you can take the derivatives, so you can take the derivatives with respect to your initial conditions, some physical parameters, or some sort of neural network. And you can also take the, the, the gradient to uh, what we call an observation operator, right? So you can basically differentiate everything end to end. So you can have your observations, and you can have uncertainties in your observations, and you can back propagate that into all of those parameters. So those things, we've, we have a, a, a model that's working for land, and we are trying to apply that now to like some fluids and some things, and, and that works really well. And it's very optimal. Yeah. Um, thanks for an interesting talk. I wonder, do, um, do, do your models have the same problems of, uh, say, chat GPT, and do they hallucinate? And what does that look like when the models go uh, crazy? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and that's actually related to uh, David's question about causal and causality. You know, so, so, so what we can see is that at times, you know, you could call that a high, some sort of hallucination in the sense that they uh, generate values that are not realistic from a physical standpoint. So, so we, we are trying to find different ways to actually uh, 
uh, limit that. So some of that are pretty ad hoc, some are more uh, sophisticated. But, but I think a lot of that is actually due to the fact that they are non-causal, right? So they can get to the right answer for the wrong reasons, right? Uh, they can just find some sort of spurious correlation because they can be smart at finding those correlations. Uh, and they can get you to the right answer, right? So we are trying to really limit those spurious correlations, and that's how we are actually seeing uh, uh, a lot of progress being made there. Yeah, but that's, uh, yeah, for instance, some of the temperature sometimes can go to like uh, sun's temperature. Which is not what we are. We are <laughs> uh, does that equation uh, help out the causality? I um, had an equation earlier up on the screen, does that? That helps, but one thing we are trying to do, I, I tend to think of them as working in tandem, right? I tend to prefer going causal first, right? So you could have a causal representation. Once you have your causal representation, which is much, much sparser, you could say you're already working in a much, much narrower space uh, or latent space, and now you can actually get to your equation discovery. I think that's the right way, or that's a slightly better way, as opposed to directly going for the equation discovery, because Again, you could get some spurious correlations, and the equation could get those spurious correlations as well. Right? So getting causal first might be a little bit better, I would think. And we have some success with this. Thank you. So my question is, at this point, do you have all the observational data you need for this work? What kind of satellites do we need to be launching uh, to collect what isn't being collected? Um, oh, well, that's, uh, that's a can of worms you could add. Uh, lots of, uh, I would say, um, I would say yes, we need more things, but I would say, um, and maybe that goes back to the earlier question, I would say we are not even using what we have right now. So um, what I showed you was a lot of like high resolution, and then some of that like, just at the end, like how we can actually use observations. We are very few actually using observations, you know, at scale, you know, uh, and in fact, we are just getting started. Um, and I think that's a major issue when you compare that and you differentiate that from the weather community, which is using that every single day, right? Um, and I think the climate community needs to really use data at scale, not just like an annual mean or a seasonal average, right, which is typically what is being used, but using like every day we are witnessing the behavior of clouds. Can we use that? Can we use that to inform the way we should represent those clouds? And that's, I think, a huge opportunity that uh, is missed at this stage. But we're having a hard time, and that relates back to the question about initial conditions. You know, like, um, <clears throat> for what you're actually seeing, you might have multiple initial conditions, so you're not very, very well defined in terms of, like, m matching one to one, right? So, but I think there's a lot to be done, like, for instance, with generative models and distribution type perspectives, you know, like, targeting more the distributions as opposed to just uh, single values. You know, that might be the way.